Welcome to the next Pivot Point podcast. This season, I am focused on sharing stories and ideas from global experts on diversity and inclusion. My purpose is to share diverse stories so that you can learn from others' lived experiences and walk away with actionable strategies to lead even more inclusively. I share this information because inclusive leadership is a journey. It requires bravery and courage, and you do not have to do it alone. At Next Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together as allies. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome to the Next Pivot Point podcast. This week, I am joined by Dr. Steve Yocavelli, aka the gay leadership dude. Yep, that's right. Uh, and he is an expert in diversity, inclusion, change management, and leadership. His consulting firm, Top Dog Learning Group, works with both Fortune 500s and not for profit organizations to bring about more inclusive and an effective workplace. An award winning author, speaker, and catalyst, Steve's not so hidden agenda is to make the world a bit more inclusive for all all of us. Well, that warms my heart. (laughs) Thank you, Steve, for joining. Thank you, Julie. It's so, so, so awesome to be here. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to dig in. Um, I got to ask you, gay leadership dude. (laughs) How'd you (laughs) come up with that? Trademark. I'm the only one in the world now because I trademarked it. (laughs) That's awesome. How'd you come up with that? And like, how do people respond to that? I'm curious. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting. So, you know, I started Top Dog almost 13 years ago, and that's kind of been my brand. And then when I was writing my latest book, Pride Leadership, my amazing publisher, um, she's just like, uh, well, she does marketing. So she was giving me all these great tips about you know, positioning it. And you, she's like, get the URL, Steve on amazon.com. I'm like, that's brilliant. Then you just redirect where you need to go. I'm like, great. So she said, you need a personal brand. I'm like, okay. And I was kind of thinking about it. I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's a leadership book for LGBTQ plus and allies. So I'm like, and you know, it's about leadership. So I'm like the gay leadership dude. And what's been really fun is as I've kind of, you know, and that's kind of like my personal brand and you know, it's affiliated with Top Dog, of course. And um, people react to it pretty well. And I said, well, you know, three things about me really, really fast. Um, I'm gay. I self-identify as a dude and I really like leadership. I'm like, so there you go. <laughs> You hit all three words in a tagline. That's hard to do. I love it. Um, Well, Steve, tell us, um, I know you're super passionate about LGBTQ plus um, issues and and education in the workplace. Um, Tell us, I'm kind of curious, what's the current state, you know, early 2021, what are, I hate to even use the word issues, but challenges of talking, I mean, we know like 50% of people are still closeted. Closet, yep. And that number hasn't changed yet. It's no. Still, so I think there's a, a, a number of things, and Julie, you hit the, the first one. Uh, I'll be intrigued to see what happens. Uh, the last time that study was done pre-COVID was, um, you know, Human Rights Campaign is usually the one who does it. And uh, that was the figure before this past summer's SCOTUS ruling about, uh, you know, gender equality and sexual orientation as, as being protected classes. And now that's a tenuous kind of legal battle. And I think there's still gonna be some conversations. Uh, There is um, an act that's been in the Senate for forever that hasn't seen the light of day yet called the Equality Act, which would really help um, beef up um, protections in the workplace so that uh, queer people to use the general term could not be fired for just being their authentic selves. So I think that's that's still a massive issue. I do think some of the rumblings that have happened during the the previous administration around marriage equality are still out there, sadly enough. I mean, uh, you know, when when two of the Supreme Court justices blatantly state that they think it should be overturned and you're like, whoa. And so I'm looking at my my husband of 20 three years, we married, um, let's see, I always forget how long we've been married because we've been together for 23 years, um, but you know, it's uh, 14, 2014. So, you know, I'm like, so they're gonna just turn that over? That's weird. So there's still that whole conversation. And yeah, it's really lovely when your rights are being debated to this day by the Supreme Court. Um, but you know, then you also kind of take in the broader context of our trans brothers and sisters and the, um, just the, the treatment that they've been receiving. Now, that being said, you know, the, the um, Biden administration is doing some incredible things with, with inclusion, not just for the LGBTQ plus community, but beyond. And, and so hopefully that will be addressed or, or at least make some, some headway in, in that respect as far as uh, really embracing gender identity and gender expression. So I think those are the top three that I personally yep. see. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the privilege uh, I, I have as a straight cisgender white woman, uh, not having to worry about losing my job because of my gender identity or sexual mm-hmm. orientation. I mean, that's, that's a, a 
gift I have just mm-hmm. by being yeah. associated with the majority group. And especially for T for the trans folks, it's, yeah. it's, it's legal in a lot of States to fire someone for that. Yep. Um, and so it's not safe. Right. So I understand why people are still closeted and, and we got to educate people, you know, with awareness, yeah. discrimination will go down. Hopefully. Eventually. I think it will. I mean, you know, um, representation truly matters. And when you see, you know, people like me or people like, you know, insert your demographic here out in the workplace, in the government, being their authentic, awesome selves, that, that goes so far. I mean, I, you know, I came out at 24 and I'm, I just turned 50. So I've spent more of my life as an, uh, an identifying as a gay man than I have not, which is kind of fun. Um, but you know, <laughs> if I, if I reflect back to like, what role models did I see in media? Yeah, it's pretty weird. And I remember when Ellen came out on TV and I was just like, what? and people were freaking out about it. Now it's just like, my goodness, you watch CW and every other superhero is a, a homo and it's awesome and I love it. So, <laughs> you know, there's, it, we're making progress, but it, there's still uh, still roads to go. Well, I, I know you and I were talking about uh, language uh, mm-hmm. before the show and it's interesting using the term homo that you just yeah. used too because I usually correct people if they say homosexual, like actually that's not the term we use anymore. And then we, I know we don't want to get like all political, like and then people get mad because it's like yeah. political. And I can't say anything right. But tell us like, what is good inclusive language to use with the LGBTQ plus? Yeah, it, it's a great, great question. And I really struggled with this when I was writing my book, Pride Leadership, because I know how I am and I know how I approach language and, and you know, not just, um, I'm, I'm a magpie when it comes to language. I, I worked for Disney Cruise cruise line for many years. And so you're surrounded by all these different cultures. And I'll just say, oh my gosh, it went all pear-shaped, which is what Australian people tend to say when things like start off great and then they go all to hell. And so it's like, I picked that up and um, I lived in France for a while. So I'll, I'll say, instead of um, like Wi-Fi, I say Wi-Fi. I just can't not say that. And I lived in England for a while and I'll sometimes say, what's my schedule? And my husband looks at me like, you're a dork. I'm like, I can't help it, you know? But but then you start to think about other words and, and their meaning. And, and I think, um, um, we've seen our, our our black and brown brothers and sisters start to do this as well, where you take back that horrible word that maybe meant some bad things, and now it's ours. And um, there's some words I don't ever want to touch still, but um, but queer is one of those words that we as a community internally we're still trying to grapple with it. I know for me it took me a while to um, be okay with saying that because you know scars of children and, and you know calling you what those names are. But now you have a, a newer generation who they're like, don't put me in a Box. I'm just queer. Like, cool. Okay, that's 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 awesome. Or or you know, also when you say LGBTQ, um, I say pl- I say plus. See, there's another French ism instead of plus, um, which is when people laugh at me for that. I'm like, I can't help it. But um, but the Q is either queer or questioning. So it could be that I'm still discovering who my authentic self is. So let me be and stop labeling me, friends. Cool. Or it's like, you know what? I'm just gonna be, you know, go with a general term of queer, and you're gonna be okay with that. That's fine too. That's really good to know. Q, so queer or questioning. So I learned something new. Um, I had thought queer and, you know, I, my instruction, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, as a, as an ally, wanting to be an ally to the LGBTQ plus community is to say, you know, the acronym itself has gender identification as well as sexual orientation correct. included. It's kind of an umbrella term and the plus really throws people and the Q really throws yeah, people. Most yeah. people can figure out the other ones. Trans, you know, well, it's kind of depends. And, but it's important that we understand those two things are not correlated just yeah. because they're protected together in that cat in those categories. Yep. Um, and you mentioned HRC. So human rights campaign listeners is a great newsletter. Um, I get their daily doses of stuff. And so yep. they're measuring this, doing studies on yeah, this. Yeah. If you want to learn more inclusive language is a great resource and they measure it too. They hold yes. companies accountable, which is really fun. And I'm sure you've had the conversation about, um, you know, Latinx, and the X is being inserted into be more more inclusive. I know I've adopted. You talk about inclusive language um, using folks. I always say folks anyway. Hey, folks. Yeah, it's a good word. But now now you re re uh, re spell it instead of the K. There's an X. And so it's I being saw that. more That's inclusive. Cool. Yeah. And so it's little things like that. And like, I put that in my email signature, um, you know, and I have a link because you know, with my pronouns and like, what's this? And it links to this cool website. So it's like little tiny things like that go so, so far to show that you're being a good ally, to show that you're mm-hmm. being consciously inclusive. Like on your, on your LinkedIn, you had your pronouns. Gorgeous. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a massive, massive beacon mm-hmm. to people um, either in my community and, and, or the trans community that are like, ah, there's an ally there inclusive. That's awesome. 
Yeah. Yeah. Pronouns are a big deal. So yeah, have them on your LinkedIn, your email signature. I used to have them on my Zoom. I realized Zoom just updated and every time we update, you have to update your profile. So I was like, shoot, I need to do that. I keep thinking about that when I log in, (laughs) but it's a signal. And I think sometimes for straight cisgender people, which cisgender means you identify the same gender of which you were assigned at birth, usually by your biology. Um, so just if you're straight or cisgender or both, especially you're like, why do I need to do that? Like everyone knows I'm a woman, right? (laughs) And I was kind of wrestling with this a few years ago before someone helped me. And just like what you said, it's kind of like a bat signal. Like you're signaling up to everybody else. Like I'm here, I want to be supportive. (laughs) And I've had countless people say, I know I can share things with you, uh, not just about gender, not just about sexual orientation, but about race and and other things. And so I was just so surprised it was that easy to signal to others. I mean, it's like back in the day, um, you know, in school offices, when I worked at university, you had the little like, hey, this is a safe space sticker on your your window. And it just meant you're free to chat about anything you want here. Uh, We are inclusive. And I think it's it's almost taking it to the next level to say, you know, and you're pushing it out there versus people coming to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I often share uh, in my work on allyship, allyship is in the eye of the beholder. So you don't get to self-proclaim like I'm (laughs) the safe place. I'm the ally, right? Right. It's like I'm committed to, or I'm striving to be an ally. That's better language around that. Or I want to be an ally. Um, Talk to us about allyship, especially in the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, tremendous strides. If you think about social change, like LGBTQ plus has gotten so much better at awareness and acceptance in such a short period of time. You know, we, I think we can attribute some of that to allies, of course, the hard work of the LGBTQ plus community, of course, sure. but tell us like the role of allies in the movement. I'm curious in your perspective. Uh, from my perspective, I think one of the biggest challenges to LGBTQ plus is for the most part, you're a hidden minority. You know, I mean, I, if I'm a person of color, it's usually pretty darn out there. Um, but if, if I'm a queer person, I sometimes have to choose who I share that with. And, and so that in of itself is you talk about like, you know, exercising and courage on a sometimes daily basis, that coming out thing. You know, I mean, I meet with clients all the time. Usually they're hiring me for, you know, leadership stuff, inclusive leadership things. Um, but a lot of times I have to purposely make sure that they know I am part of a minority, that I am a member of uh, the LGBTQ plus community. And so, you know, that, that kind of like forced outing, um, I think has been a, a big help with, with our community because it's not making assumptions that, you know, oh, you got this covered. And so you, when you have things like National Coming Out Day, which is in October, just so you all know, um, and that's, you know, and, and we people are encouraged to like, like be, own who you are, be your authentic self, let people know around you that, who love you and trust you that this is who your authenticity is. And I think that really helps spur a lot of allies and allyship because, you know, to our point earlier, Julie, when we were, we were just going before, we got on, um, you know, then, then people are like, oh, oh, you're like one degree away from me. I didn't know that because I couldn't see you before. And it just makes it a little bit more of a personal thing that people are like, no, 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 you can't say that about, cause that's my cousin. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's whomever. And, and I think that really, and I saw that in my own family, you know, and that's kind of how things really change. Um, couple with, you know, the exposure in media and, and, you know, that the acceptance is out there and, and, you know, yay, we finally get our own cheesy Hallmark movies with, with queer people. Woohoo. <laughs> it's like, and, and that's silly. And I, I'm, I'm half making fun of it, but that's really a big deal. And, and, and the fact that um, I can, I can watch, you know, um, Fran Drescher set up her son in this really bad Christmas movie or turn on um, something on, it was on, I think on HBO Max, where it was like uh, the 12 dates of Christmas and, you know, the three characters, uh, it's like The Bachelor, but with three people instead of just one. And one was a gay boy. And it's like, yes, you know, like you get to see yourself reflected. And that goes so, so far to help you feel like you belong, but also for people to be exposed to those different types of demographics that maybe they weren't a part of. Yeah. Representation matters, like you said earlier. And you got to see it to believe it. And, yeah. you know, you think about your own journey, you waited till 24 to come out. And For our generation, Gen Xers and early millennials, I I tend to fall in that category. You hear that a lot. I mean, I I had five friends come out the summer after senior year of high school. And I was like, well, you could have told me that before. Right? Like, why'd you wait? Uh, I didn't feel safe. I didn't see myself reflected, right? I didn't think it would be accepted. And it was really sad because I just felt like there was this whole part of their identity I didn't know. But I felt so also so... um, 
excited that they felt comfortable sharing that sure, with me too sure. as an ally. So it's, it's interesting now thinking about that generational differences, you know, one of my, uh, one of the things I hear from corporate a lot is like this next generation, you know, they're going to solve <laughs> this problem, this diversity problem. They're so diverse and they care about it. Yes. And it's <laughs> yes, not fair to let them solve our, the problems we created right, for this Gen Z that's coming in and very much kind of reminds me of millennials and we thought we could change the world and we're kind of stifled and put into the boxes just like previous sure. generations. What do you see young people like what they give us some, uh, some reason to be excited that young people <laughs> truly can try to change. Well, you, you know, I, 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 I often have um, some of my clients come up, they're like, do you teach like generations in the workplace? I'm like, no, I do not on purpose because I am a big, massive believer that I know some millennials who are horrible technology. I know some baby boomers who are like rock star iPhoneers. And so just one example. So I try not to fall out on stereotype path. However, um, what I'm seeing in, like I look at my, my nieces and nephews and they're all in their twenties and such and um, either in the workplace or entering the workplace. And they've just been exposed to, you know, having a, a queer person in their life their entire existence. And so, you know, like um, it's Uncle Steve and Uncle Richard, and that's just how it's always been. And they don't even think about it. And, and so getting back to that whole representation matters, that exposure, you know, it, it's it's almost like that, that desensitizing, if you will, or there's not that like, oh my gosh, there's two ladies on and they just kissed. They're like, eh, who cares? Like they're just exposed to it. And I think that's the most exciting part that as we keep going down this this human journey um things like that like like when when you know my niece is always like oh i have like like four trans friends i'm like that's awesome that you know they love you enough they they share their authenticity you're supportive of course i know she would be but you know, like like that to me is awesome and more importantly her trans friends feel comfortable to be their authentic selves in their existence. And that's even more awesome. And so that's kind of what excites me that there's both that um, acceptance and support allyship that seems to be more prevalent um, with, with people who are a little bit younger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and tell us shifting gears a little bit to your corporate, I know you work a lot with the fortune 500 types. Yep. Um, and you talked about being a conscious inclusive leader, yep. uh, and your, your book, uh, yep. about leadership, what do leaders in corporate America need to do to be inclusive? It's a, it's a great, great question, Julie. So I'm going to tell you how I got to that phrasing just because it's a fun story. Um, so years ago when I was working at Disney, I was doing one of my first leadership classes and we're talking about unconscious bias. So I'm you know, kind of all excited, you know, do my little class. And there's this gentleman in the back of the room and he's just like, mm. you could totally tell he was voluntold to be there, like was so not on board. So we go through you know, some of the content, we get to a break and I go back to, back to the room and, and uh, Bob will say his name is, I'm like, Bob, are, is there anything you'd like to share with me? He's like, well, you're talking about unconscious bias. Well, if it's unconscious, I can't do anything about it. I'm like, all right, well, thank you for the education, Bob. And, and so ever since that point, I said, you know, I, I, I get where Bob's coming from um, you know, as far as like unconscious, but as you well know, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, you know unconscious bias, you can do something about it. It takes some action. So, so that's why I kind of started using the phrase being consciously inclusive. So kind of taking the opposite because there are actions that we can take. And that's kind of the, the main story, if you will, um, that I work with to this day. And, and it's inclusive of allyship, being there for the others, just making a true effort to create that space, as we talked about a few moments ago, to be more inclusive to whomever, whether that be to, to different genders, races, sexual orientations, insert whatever here. And so what are the things we can do? We talked about some of them already, like looking at your language. Um, I, okay, I'm from Philly originally and forever I'd say, hey, you guys come here. And you know, while that's, that's accepted to be you know, meaning all sorts of people, it really isn't. I mean, if it, there's gonna be people who are just like, uh, no, I'm not a guy, thank you very much. So you know, luckily I moved to the South many, many years ago. So I say y'all now and that's y'all means y'all and that's, that's good. But it's little things like that that can really go a long way to be more inclusive. I know um, I also spent some time working at IBM and when I was at IBM, I uh, was in the women's network because I wanted to support my female coworkers and also understand a little bit more about what are some of the personal challenges that they face simply based upon their gender. And, and it was such a great experience for me as, as a man to be like, whoa, that's so not cool. What the heck are we doing? And um, you know, doing things like that 
again, that, that forces me to open my eyes and, and be uncomfortable, quite frankly, and, and I'll own the, un- the discomfort. But that taught me so, so much about being a better ally for my, the women in my life. And so you know, that's another strategy that you can do to be more, more inclusive. And I think the third thing too that we can do, and I always phrase this in my workshops as you think in, speak up, act out. So you think in about yourself, what are the things about me? What's my unconscious bias? You can Google Project Implicit and start to discover some of those as well. Um, a speak out is, is really looking at um, how do you not engage in silent collusion? You know, those disparaging things are said in the workplace. Um, you know how all women drive and you don't say anything. Well, you're supporting that. You don't want to do that. That's a gorgeous way as a leader to erode your credibility is to engage in silent collusion and, and, and to really discredit that or, or not refute those disparaging statements being said. Um, and then the last really is um, the act out is looking at your, your organization. You know, what are the forms in HR? Are they, are they the gender binary, you know, you know, male, female? Oh, that's not very inclusive. Um, what are your workplace um, uh, benefits for uh, healthcare, for the trans community? You know, what is, when you have family medical leave, what does that mean? Is, you know, and so looking at different ways that we can be as an organization more inclusive is probably like the third step that we can do. Yeah, that's such a holistic way to address it. So say that mantra again. What was think it? In, think in. So it's about yourself. Think speak in. Speak up. It's like the up. people immediately around you. Yep. And then act out, which is the Good. organization. Got it. Got it. I think uh, that could be a great t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I I didn't have a logo. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. No, I mean, you got to do some introspective work first and to the point about thinking and then speaking, using your voice and acting out, um, active allyship. You know, we're not asking for people just to sit behind their books and their (laughs) podcasts. Um, It's great if you're listening to this, but you need to use your voice, especially if you're associated with the majority group. Like that's why we need our allies. And, And I often say, it's really uncomfortable to speak up sometimes, you know, you mentioned those like, yeah, women drivers or Asian drivers, you know, people have these stereotypes and microaggression things they say that just like, you know, when it doesn't feel right, like your stomach kind of like turns like, if you feel that feeling, especially if it's happening to somebody else, say something. And the words of encouragement I give, because a lot of people are like, I don't want to like rock the boat. I don't want to upset somebody. I don't disrupt the relationship. There's all these excuses about me. Like just (laughs) tell yourself like, so if I don't say anything, I'm okay with that happening again. Sure. Right? And, like, people are, and, and as a leader, people are always watching you and yeah. they're watching what you do and don't do, what you say and don't say. I am, um, as part of, it's in my book and it's one of the things I teach in, in a lot of my, my speeches and stuff. And matter of fact, we'll put it in the show notes because I created like a, a, we create self-paced learning. We call them learning tapas, like little tiny nuggets. Um, and there's six ways to beat silent collusion in the workplace. So it's called MOPSAM. Um, and it's, it's a cheeky, cheeky way to remember it. So I, the way I introduce it uh, in the thing is it's a picture of this very, very wooly dog, uh, which is called a Hungarian pulley mop or mop dog. And his name is Sam. So breed and name, mop Sam, it's the six ways you can remember. And it, it's, you know, this is the, the educator and me kind of geeking out as a doctor. And, um, it's hard so- to remember stuff in the moment. I mean, acronyms, Ooh. imagery works. Yep. And, and so it just, you know, it's, um, like and it's things like uh, you you at the A in Mop Sam is ask. So you you ask what did somebody mean by that? And of course, watching your tone, like Julie, what did you mean by that? No, that's not how you do it. It's Julie, what did you mean by that? That you know you know how all women drive, and neutral tone, ask the question and just see what the response is. Typically, someone's reacting from that unconscious and they're like, oh, rats, I didn't realize that. You know, or um, you can go all the way to um, to say a non-word, uh, which is like. Yeah, and this happened to me, the story about like, you know, how a woman drive is actually a true story. Um, I was in, in Atlanta at a client site. We were like closing out a project. It was great. And went, one of my top doggers was there and this, all the rest of like the 30 people on the project and were just ready to start. And the senior executive at the end of the table, literally the one signing the checks for my company for this change management project was like, well, you know how a women drive. And it was like the eighties record screech, you know, <laughs> it was just like, and we all just kind of turned him, and, but no one said a word at that one moment. And that's, of course, when we were all engaging in that inclusion. Well, what seemed to be like 30 minutes was really like a few moments. This um, young gentleman who wasn't even at the table, he was kind of like a, the, the chair against the wall, just joined the company not that long ago. He just folded his arms and went, damn. And it was crystal clear how he thought about that comment. And that <laughs> kind of led, you know, everyone to kind of give it. And that's, that's one of the six strategies is you say a non-word, like, damn, what? You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, Screech. And so like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you like, you keep these in your back pocket. And I kind of coach and teach leaders that 
you know, some are more comfortable than others. Some are more appropriate in the moment. They have their pros and cons. They all do. But um, just keep them there because when that that disparaging comment happens, and they will, mm-hmm. what are you going to do in that moment as an inclusive leader? Yep. Yeah. People are watching and they're watching. Yeah. When you're silent about something because yeah. it's hard and remind yourself it's selfish to think I don't have to say anything oh, no. like that's really showing your privilege. It's right? not my group. Yeah. Not my group. <laughs> not my battle. I'm going to stay safe over here. And yeah. You know, at the end of the day, like, what's it going to cost you? Like, people aren't going to trust you. People yep. aren't going to share hard things with you. People if, aren't. You're not going to get the most from your team. Yeah. If Steve doesn't defend that group, what's he going to do when it's my group? Right. Yep. Right. And imagine how all the women feel. Like, oh, he doesn't like women. You know, that's where my mind would be going. <laughs> yeah well steve this has been so fantastic uh good talk to you forever um these tools yes let's link to those in the show notes so people following you want to listen get steve's book um just kind of in wrapping up how can people get in touch with you how can they follow your work so um, we have a centralized hub or a doghouse, I guess you might say, um, topdoglearning.biz, B-I-Z. Um, there you can find free stuff like the MopSam link, um, stuff about the book. There's free chapters and audiobooks and stuff like that. Uh, and then all of our online classes are also held there as well. And you can also send me a message, uh, me or my team. Uh, uh, Top Dogger will happily stand by. <laughs> I love it. Yes, that MopSam. Uh, I think people are really looking for tangible tools. So. Yeah. Take them up on it. Download those free resources and get in touch with Steve. Thanks so much for being on today. It was so fun to talk to you. so much, Julie. This is awesome. I appreciate you listening to this episode. If you like this podcast, the best way you can be an ally is to write a review on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Every review helps other allies find us. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together as allies.